thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to see a great turnout and we're really excited about the dialogue that we can cultivate at the end of my brief presentation. So to get us started, I'd like to have you all participate in a poll so we can get a better sense of where you're coming from and your experience with this topic. So Amy, if you could start the first poll, please. We will introduce a question to you all. And if you could please answer the first question here, do you think of water when you think of urban planning? And we'll give you just a couple moments to answer that poll. And then we'll see what the result is of that. Okay, I'll give you a couple more seconds. And then Amy, if you could close that poll and share the results with us. Looks like we have a large majority of folks who do think of water when you think of urban planning. So none of this should be that new to anyone, but hopefully we can dig a little deeper and explore it a little bit more together. So our second poll, is the second question here on the screen. And if Amy, if you could now introduce that poll question and we invite all of you to participate in the second question. Is there a body of water you associate with place where you come from or where you work or where you live? Okay, and I think we can actually close that poll because we have 100% participation already. And Amy, if we could share the results of that poll now. So a large majority of us do identify with a body of water that we associate with place. Thank you so much, Amy. So we'll hide those results now and, and leap into the conversation. So there are some, I think there's always a question maybe, why, why, why do we talk about water in the urban environment? And I think for many of us, as we've identified in that poll, we do think of water. We, we do think of the connection that water has when we're thinking of urban planning. And this is because a majority of the world's population lives in or near urban areas, and that many of, of the people around the world live near a surface freshwater body, as well as uh, many people who live along coasts. So the relationship to water is key to our existence and to our identity. And I think that's, um, in, in starting this conversation, I'm going to turn it personal for a moment and, and talk about my connection to water and my identity. I am a daughter of the Chesapeake Bay. I grew up in the the mother county of Maryland along near the St. Mary's River and the Texas River and near Clement St. Clement's Bay and my identity and my memory is rooted in that that experience with those waterways and with the relationship to those waterways and there are many cultural practices around the world where we do see ourselves in identity of place in the Maori tradition in New Zealand for instance where I've spent some time over the years um, Many Maori people start each formal meeting with an introduction. This long introduction includes a relationship to a river and a mountain, uh, as well as their tribe and their landscape. And so there is this deep connection to place that many people around the world can start to cultivate or have cultivated from childhood. And I think when we think about urban areas and water and identity, um, there are many cities that are centered on waterways, that were started because of the relationship to water, whether it's as a source of food, a source of connection, travel, trade, economy, all of these things. Our cities are connecting us um, with these bodies of water. But oftentimes, and as we have developed these places, these spaces, we have taken this access for granted over the years. We have had issues with pollution and degradation. And sometimes we ignore those water bodies. But I think there is, a um, a turn in that and many places are returning to the water and facing the water or digging deep to daylight waters, streams that have been buried or piped over time. So many of these cities and many of the cities that you see on the screen now are cities that we have worked in or our collaborators have worked in where we're reviewing the way that water is part of the relationship we have in urban cities, uh, urban planning and in the way we, we think about cities. It's also a question of ecological democracy. It is about um, asking the questions of what is this in terms of environmental justice question and how can urban planning projects and design projects address this issue when it comes to water quality and access. 
um, we have to start questioning our vulnerable communities also facing further disadvantage as it relates to a relationship with water, to access to clean water, whether that's potable water or water for recreation or just waterways that are in our neighborhoods. So then that all becomes the foundation for how we start to think of an urban ecological planning process. And at Biohabitats, we have been, over the last several years, refining this methodology for a holistic approach to urban planning that grounds itself in ecology and ecological function. And thinking about how we work within the framework of a city in the city planning approach, but weaving it through a lens of ecology and water as a key component of that. So today, we are not going to get into the depth of the description of our approach or a process um, that is associated with this approach. We are actually going to um, develop a, a webinar that I'll talk about at the end of our presentation today where we can um, get into it deeper. But today, we're going to pull out the part about water and explore it a little bit more as it relates to urban ecological planning and this framework. So I'll kind of touch on some of these different steps um, to, to walk us through this discussion. Always grounding ourselves in ecology and water, hydrology as part of the ecosystem. So starting out, in the early phases of our approach, we're really starting with data analysis and understanding the existing conditions. And here, I wanna stop and take just a moment to recognize our uh, amazing collaborators at City of Baltimore Planning Department. So the project I'm about to talk a little bit about is the Baltimore Green Network Plan that we did working with the Planning Department of Baltimore City uh, several years ago. And that project was really a project where um, they were interested in addressing a, a large challenge of vacant lands and vacant structures found across the city of Baltimore and wanting to find a way to um, utilize those vacants or re-envision those vacant lands as they could tie into creating a, a strengthened, resilient kind of green network plan for future development, for future economic revitalization, for future community connections across the city of Baltimore. So um, in leading this project from an ecological foundational perspective, we were able to kind of ground the question of how do we deal with vacant lots and consider the opportunities for green networks through ecology and thinking of ecosystems. And a key part of that is waterways. So here on this uh, screen with the first couple of data views that we took in our existing conditioning analysis, we're looking at the water as a part and parcel of the identity of Baltimore, the three major stream networks, and how they run through the city and into the Inner Harbor, into the Patapsco River. And then in the other part of this is looking at the historic ecology. So um, by great luck, the city of Baltimore has a robust um, data set that includes historic streams. So those that have been over time piped um, and buried underground, but they had record of where they were as historic streams. So it was wonderful be, to be able to look at the historic patterns of water in the landscape associated with also the forest cover in those areas and then overlay that on what is existing as kind of their current green space network and use that as a foundational beginning of exploring the opportunities for establishing a green network plan for the city of Baltimore. An important part of this process and something that is very much iterative, so we always come back to it and sort of um, ground ourselves in it, is the uh, engagement with the community. And this addresses this, this question of how are we considering questions of ecological democracy and environmental justice. So in the urban planning framework, we're stopping at key points during the project to engage with the community, to ask them questions about their identity with place, to ask them their connection, their ideas and concepts and desires for how the utilization of these vacant lots in the case of Baltimore City could be re-envisioned for serving community needs. And, and we ground ourselves in understanding the relationships and the desires of the community. Here are some examples from our work in City of Atlanta, another great partner where we worked with them on an urban ecological framework plan a couple years after our work in Baltimore City. And again, part of this is engaging the community in a variety of, of creative ways to help pull out their experiences, their stories of relationships to water, to land, to ecology, and, and understanding um, the great vision that they have for integrating these spaces in, in a way that is more holistic and is also helping build resilience in the community, both for ecology and for the human inhabitants. 
But then we're also coming back to data analysis. So then there's another series of, of data analysis steps that we took. They really, in the case of Baltimore City, which we're looking at the data for now on the screen, lo looked at a variety of different data layers and started pulling to them together in a GIS suitability and prioritization analysis. And what we're trying to do is pull out patterns of connections and potential from this data, looking at everything from stream corridors and topography to historic plans of parks and green space across the city, historic redlining, so we understand what some of the background is to, to displacement and, and vulnerability in different communities, perhaps not having access to certain um, opportunities, uh, urban tree canopy results based on Baltimore ecosystem study research, so other people's research that could inform our work in a very holistic way. And then we're looking for in the end, ways of connecting these systems. So trying to um, promote the health of the existing stream and water body systems, looking for opportunities for integration of stormwater best management practices, restoration opportunities, open space opportunities. And in this case, also, where are the points of potential for economic redevelopment and revitalization? Because it wasn't just a green space plan, it was really about community resilience. So all of that, again, we can take it at different scales. So a different project example that we've worked on also at kind of at a neighborhood scale, but thinking again of integrating hydrology into urban ecosystem and urban ecology planning is this work that we did in city of Detroit, working with the planning department there on the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood plan. So here we were looking at the relationship to the Detroit River the relationship to the tributaries into the Detroit River that directly came through our neighborhood, the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood, looking at the issues with flooding, the changes in topography, the historic stream quarters where there were low points, and then trying to understand how do we integrate into that ecological restoration or enhancement opportunities, open space opportunities, and stormwater best management practices that continue to help create a feeling of connectedness and a sense of resilience within the community. Further, in our work with the city of Atlanta, again with the city um, department of planning there, we were looking at themes as it related to this idea of identity. And, and many of these themes relate directly to, again, the presence of streams and water courses and the relationships to those streams and water courses and wetlands and open water areas that the communities had. And so you can see in, in great detail in a couple of these graphics, especially the one on the far left, and the one in the center. Although these were designing for or sort of planning for preservation of certain maybe green space, all of them connected to the stream corridors that helped define the city of Atlanta and the relationship that the city has to two very large river corridors on the east and the west side. But one of the lessons that I think is, is a great one to keep in mind is that these planning processes, these urban ecological framework plans, these green network plans, can just be plans that sit on a shelf. And, and the, the people that we worked with at the Baltimore um, Department of Planning as well as in Atlanta, they all recognized the importance of making sure these weren't just static plans, but that integrated into the planning process was actually the opportunity to design pilot projects with the community. So on the screen right now, the example I'm showing is from our work in Baltimore City. And so there were key locations that the city and the planning, uh, our team identified with the communities that were ideal locations for, for starting to put in some pilots that address community needs and desires. So in the top of the screen on the left, you have the existing conditions of this small open space, a vacant space that the community had identified previous to us even starting the Green Network Plan, they wanted to have a playground for small children. That was the need that needed to be addressed. So we worked with the city and the planning department and the community members to work out a design and they actually put pen to paper, the community members in this community-based design approach to help design what that looked like. And then we prepared some simulations to help show. So another example in one of the other neighborhoods that was a focus area was Fantown Winchester neighborhood. And here again, the design was this combination of the community um, writing out and sketching out the needs that they saw and knew would be best met for the residents, 
as well as an uh, opportunity for us to address some of the ecological potential. So here's some stormwater best management practices in rain gardens, but also a water amenity for kids to play in, an open space for there to be films, and this kind of open social gathering area in the middle with specific elements that community members had identified. The final example from the Baltimore Green Network Plan is one that is close to my heart because I got to visit it a couple of times and engage with the community members here. It is the site actually of um, some row homes that were taken down sadly because there had been a fire in the homes and a firefighter during a training session within one of these homes had passed away. So this community had explicitly asked for this to become a memorial to that firefighter and allow it to also be another um, play space for young children in the neighborhood. It was needed and it was, um, this design was based explicitly on their desires and hopes for the space, along with our input on integrating stormwater management, habitat, um, potential through native plant gardens, and all of this combined fed into a design process that went beyond our planning process with the Neighborhood Design Center and other local partners, and they're moving this forward as a pilot project for the neighborhood. So that opportunity to actually um, create pilot projects that can be built from the plan really helps these plans become more than just these static books on a shelf or PDFs on a website, but allow for them to start to help see a new vision for a space, a vision that can integrate ecological function at various levels and water management and relationships to water in different ways. So finally, here are um, kind of the final plans for two of the examples I mentioned, plus another plan that we did at a more regional scale in Kansas City, Missouri. But all three, these are sort of the final plans that lay out all the different um, desires and needs that were met through the planning process and the alignment of this idea of relationship to water and water management and water potential as part of identity, along with the other kind of ecological uh, features and considerations that consider the larger landscape ecological connections and potential for um, providing for more resilient spaces for our communities. So finally, a note on different certifications or opportunities that we can look to some of these national or international um, groups that have started to think about how do we um, create a series of metrics potentially. Now we didn't follow these certifications explicitly, but I think they're always in the back of our minds because there's some really good thought that's been put into them. So like the, the LEED certification for buildings or sites, for specific sites, <clears throat> There are the opportunities with the Living Building Challenge. They have a sister challenge called the Living Community Challenge. And there is a water pedal associated with that challenge that could opportunistically be something one looked at when one thinks of, of trying to consider the opportunities for water in a larger kind of planning effort. Other opportunities or other types of considerations for district scale or city scale might include the eco districts work and the donut model that's coming out of Europe thinking about kind of whole systems and holistic planning. A lot more to, I think, explore there as we move into the future of what there is in the potential for ecological framework planning and um, great opportunity for all of us to learn more, I think. So to wrap it up, I'll just say that as I mentioned early on, this was just a very kind of scratching the surface um, look at our green network or urban ecological framework planning approach. Um, we are very excited to be um, developing a series of webinars later in the summer um, to go into much more detail of the urban ecological framework planning process to get a little bit more into the detail behind our analysis and our community engagement. And we look forward to hosting those webinars and having many of you join us for those as we deepen our discussion and consider the wonderful opportunity there is to think about ecology as this lens that can be holistic in considering all the many elements of urban planning and community resilience as we look to the future in considering impacts of climate change and other impacts that may be affecting our communities. So keep an eye out in your emails for those upcoming webinars. We will have a story map we're developing as well for that. And there are a number of resources here on the screen um, that you can follow up on some of the specific projects I mentioned today for a little bit more information. So with that, I thank you all for being here with me and participating, and I welcome your questions and a discussion that we can have to 
further this conversation. So I'll wait to hear from Crystal with our questions. All right. So we do have, uh, let's start off with a question we received right before um, from a from another person. Um, okay, so how do you convince a city to be forward thinking when they have an economic focus on a uh, huge multi-development? Sure, that is a great question. And it's definitely a challenge that I think, especially right now, given our, our kind of economic situation um, during this pandemic, there is going to need to be some focus on um, development or supporting our community through a variety of ways. And I think it's, it's not an either or. And specifically in our project work in Atlanta with the urban ecology framework, it actually came out of a, a project that um, the city planning department had developed before we joined them to work on the UEF. And they had um, developed this whole plan called the Atlanta City Design Plan. And a major driver of that was the knowledge and understanding that there was going to be enormous population growth in the city of Atlanta. And with that, enormous development pressures. So there had been a process that was going on before our work. And then during our work, we looked at this idea of where would be these, these kind of focused economic development cores or corridors in their case in Atlanta. And so we knew that there would be focused development, denser development in those areas, ideally then avoiding those areas that are sensitive ecological sites, um, areas of high habitat and biodiversity, and our sensitive stream resources so that there could be an acknowledgement and a planning for those economic development growth corridors and a population growth with that but also there could at the same time be hand in hand with that um, preservation, celebration, enhancement of the ecological um, resources that really help define the identity of the city. So they can work together. Great question. All right, they're, they're flying in now. Okay, so uh, let's go to, do these in order here. Uh, were any of these pilot projects built and was the focus of the pilot project equity, uh, for example, access to playgrounds over water and ecology? So I am, I am not sure. I don't think any of them have been completed yet, although I do know that the, the last example, the firefighter memorial, had gone into concept design with the Neighborhood Design Center and some local um, landscape architects and volunteers. So I, I know that one was moving forward. I do think that the the impetus for that one was in remembering and memorializing the firefighter and having that playground built. So I think the added bonus was being able to integrate stormwater management, best practices, and integration of native habitat, but it all complemented one another. But in at least um, the, the two cases with the playgrounds, those were the driving needs of the community that helped shape um, the beginning of those designs. Um, okay, so here's another one. Uh, in light of equity, diversity, and ongoing efforts by hashtag shutdown STEM today, how many black and people of color work for biohabitat? And how is biohabitat working to promote uh, equity internally? Sure. Great question. Uh, currently, I think we have two black members of staff and maybe one or two other people of color. So um, we and our staff is about, I think we're around 60 people right now, maybe just over 60 people. So we definitely uh, need to address and try to um, bring more diversity into our staff. We are, we are a better balance of men and women than maybe in the past, but that doesn't address the question of people of color and, and minority communities. And I think we have been having this um, conversation internally for a few years and have been actually doing more outreach in our community at the high school and college level to try to activate interest and in integration through internships um, with local students to get experience in our work and our area of work, which is environmental consulting, both environmental engineering, landscape architecture, environmental planning, and aquatic and terrestrial ecology. So I think we are trying to address that, but we still have work to do, absolutely, in integrating more P 
people of color on our staff. Um, we are doing uh, more in the projects that we are opening up now with regard to um, more partnerships when we can with minority owned businesses. Um, and, and I think that is continuing to be a priority for us. Can't remember if I answered the whole question. I think you got both halves of it, yes. Um, okay, let's keep flying through these. All right, so could you talk about ecological democracy and how and where those practices are being applied? Yes, that's a great question. And I actually, I meant to credit that term um, comes from the, the work and the practice of Randy Hester, who is a professor and a practitioner um, and really a, a sociologist and advocate for community-based design. And he's been working with um, people both in California and in, in his home state of North Carolina on integrating that into community um, landscape architecture and planning efforts. And he has a great book about that and he has followed it up with a couple of other incredible books and he is a professor so i think he has had a lot of students come out of his programs um, that are working on the this approach to really it's it's it's, it's multi-layered and i won't get all of it on this conversation probably but it's it's about really connecting the community to the landscape through this process and um, as, as I've sort of described in community-based design, um, having more of a leadership role on the community side uh, where we, we sort of facilitate the discussion, um, but there is a lot more engagement of the community in the design, in, in actually creating these designs and really connecting with ecosystems and the natural world in a very deep way in planning and design. I probably haven't given enough um, description to that, but his book is amazing. It's sort of a Bible for my um, work, one of the many kind of leading texts that I refer back to frequently. Great, okay. So uh, one more question about, uh, let's see, the folks involved with this. So how do you see, foresee engineers being part of the urban ecology framework? Sure. Um, well, I, I should have probably mentioned more explicitly our practice at Biohabitats includes both environmental engineers and landscape architects and planners and scientists. And so we are always sitting at a table with all of those practices represented in mind and in practice. Um, and, and always, I think the engineering part is important. And Crystal, you can speak to this too as an engineer. Um, because we are, we are wanting to make sure that as we get from plan to concept development to design to construction, these are feasible projects that can actually be built in the ground. The planning scale, like the green network plan that I showed, we, we didn't get to the site scale except in those specific pilot projects and there was not a lot of design scope for us on those projects. Were there to have been more design scope, we probably would have actually brought the engineers in to do um, to do this kind of interdisciplinary design approach to the design of those BMPs within the landscape. So really for us, engineers, especially environmental engineers or stormwater engineers, civil engineers with a background in ag or, or landscape management, are a pivotal part of the conversation for design because we are designing for experience, aesthetic, function, all of those things together. Great. Uh, all right. So uh, what about ecological planning in the most burned out and poorest urban areas like Detroit or Flint? Mm. Well, Detroit and Flint are very special places for me. I actually went to school in Michigan at the University of Michigan for my graduate studies in landscape architecture. And I did my final graduate thesis project, if you will, in Flint on the Flint River at the Chevy and the whole site, um, which was an old Chevy manufacturing site that had been cleared and had been capped. And we had the opportunity to kind of look at it as a potential for uh, what is the future or what are a few future scenarios for the site that could promote community resilience, economic redevelopment, and ecological re restoration. So I think that there are challenges, of course, in terms of the economics of those cities and other cities. Um, but there's also an opportunity to really think of the grassroots partners in those cities. There's so many amazing local groups, local environmentalists, community groups 
who are doing really good work. And I think tying into those efforts that are already going on and then helping kind of bridge that with the planning efforts. So in Detroit in the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood, we were interacting with on a regular basis, the urban farmers, the, there was a flower farmer, a couple different community organizers who had plots of land for children's and other sort of social activities. And working with them, we could really find a way to kind of bring to life some of the ecological potential in the neighborhood, but through the, the avenues that probably make the most sense for those communities and through the players who are gonna be there far longer than we would be able to be there as consultants on like a specific um, scope and contract. So it was, and those were some of the most special days too in the community, um, working, talking through their processes, talking through um, what they were doing on their land, and then talking through sort of the bigger picture implications or impacts they could have if things were changed to kind of add a little bit more of a buffer of native trees or other stormwater management techniques. So um, I think there's loads of potential in, in all sorts of communities um, with varying sort of pressures or constraints that they might be facing. Okay, next question. How are regulatory requirements worked into these ecological frameworks? For example, to sure. me, stormwater management regulatory requirements at scale and improve water quality. Right. So in each case, it, it sort of depends on the project and the project scope. But I think um, in both cases, more actually, to I think, to a degree in the Atlanta project, we were interfacing directly with um, the Department of Water and, and Public Works and understanding the stormwater um, requirements, the stormwater challenges that they were facing, different hot spots, different areas that had already been identified as opportunities for the introduction of best management practices, uh, different areas with um, flooded zones. And so we were taking all of that into consideration through the out the planning process. And again, that speaks to this idea of engagement isn't just with the community, oh, that's really a focus. Uh, the, the opportunity to create some very robust stakeholder engagement with clients and sort of parallel client groups. So if we're working with the planning department, also being in touch with other departments, Parks and Rec, DPW, um, Water Services, to make sure that we can be considering all the different potential regulations, requirements, or, or ways to optimize the, the work that the planning effort can, can be um, completed or accomplished. Great. Now we have a question uh, about stormwater BMPs. So the question is, how have other cities worked uh, long-term long operations and maintenance into these plans? Um, and then just a general comment that stormwater BMPs are tricky to maintain and often require more than volunteers. They often fall to public works departments that might not have training on the proper techniques. That's true. And I think that is that we have found that to be the case in Baltimore. And I may have to defer to Jennifer Massette in her, her presentation that's coming up in two weeks. She'll probably get into this a little bit more as a stormwater engineer. But I think we can say that um, from my experience and my observation, what has worked and has helped is when there might be a kind of community watershed organization who may have some role and responsibility in maintenance um, in the city. So in the case of the, there are some BMPs on the streetscape in Baltimore. Some of them, I believe, although I could be wrong about this, are maintained by our local watershed association or in partnership with those communities, um, Blue Water Baltimore. So having, and in the case of that, I keep returning to this, but I think it's a very interesting example, the firefighter memorial pilot project for the Green Network Plan, the Rachel Wilson Memorial, one of the project partners was Bon Secours, the hospital, system that is located in that neighborhood. And I think they had an agreement to help with maintenance of that park. And so if there were BMPs integrated into that park design, I believe that it would be through some sort of agreement with that partnering organization. So agreed, it's very difficult um, unless the the department of the public works department um, has already sort of set aside some sort of maintenance for all of these new BMPs that are being integrated, it can be um, better to find a, a, a more regional or community level partner organization who can help um, with that. And a watershed organization is ideal in many ways because they're already thinking about water quality and water management at the local scale. 
just had a question pop up that is directly related to the O&M. So the question is, have you considered innovative funding models to assist with long-term O&M? Relying on dwindling city services and a weak tax base seems like an unstable model. Right, I think we're already sort of witnessing those challenges in, in some of these projects that we've been um, participating in, just knowing that the budgets are limited for many of the departments in the, in the city world. And so I think it is, I think, thinking about what are these alternatives that are more creative. Um, another thing that we've been trying to bring more to the conversation and Philadelphia has, has done a great job with some of their um, programs is trying to find a way to integrate green jobs programs into the city structure or into some sort of funded structure, maybe with alternative funding um, that allows for both new employment opportunities and uh, maintenance and management of some of these sites. So in Philadelphia, there is this maintenance of vacant lots that have been greened to a kind of minimal extent. And then they have agreements with community members and groups or organizations who are, who are participating in the maintenance and management of those sites. So there are some interesting new models appearing, and I think there's a lot more potential for, for tying into that. Great. Okay, let's switch zones a little bit and talk about um, how, how to partner with developers, really. So the question is, um, as an entry-level land planner working in a space where our project focus is primarily meeting zoning compliance in the interest of housing development, how would you suggest emphasizing the importance of these issues when developers are primarily interested in keeping costs low and in a quick turnaround? Sure. I think that's a great question. I think it's a, a real question and a challenge that we're facing. I, th I think many of us would argue that there are long-term savings that are associated with introducing green infrastructure into development projects. We have a lot of different examples of projects at a variety of scales um, where introducing integrated water services or integration of green stormwater management um, may be a little bit of an extra upfront cost, but could in the long term um, help the developer or the owner of that building or structure or series of buildings save on costs associated with water. If you're able to recycle the water and use it within the building for potable water or for, not potable, but for toilet flushing and other uses within the building through a filtering system, but capturing that rainwater, that is only um, possible in some areas, of course, in arid locations, areas in the West, you may not be able to capture water. But I think there's the opportunity to look at the cost savings, the long-term cost savings, um, energy savings, if you have a green roof and can sort of lower your cooling costs, uh, integrating more tree canopy into the space to help um, prepare the, the space and create a cooler environment that might also lower energy costs. There's a lot of dis discussion about, and we could go on for a whole different webinar about ecosystem services and the opportunities and implications um, within the built environment for considering ecosystem services. We've been doing that in some work here in Baltimore with some kind of very urban development planning work. Um, we're really thinking big picture holistically can add to um, long-term savings for costs for developers. Right, we have a couple more questions. So uh, are you thinking about planning differently in the time of COVID-19? So that's a very good question. I think um, I think that's something we're all exploring right now. What, what about this time changes things for us? And what really just actually reinforces things that we've been thinking about already? I think we already know, based on a lot of research, the value of access to open space and green space for all um, members of, of our community to help promote physical health and well-being. And we know that in the COVID times that we're currently living um, within, there is a desire and a lot of people are getting out into open space more and more to sort of have that relief and to have some connection and commu communing with nature. I think we also know that um, this has, we're all sort of in a stay at home mode, many of us still in, in the work environment. And in terms of the planning process, it's definitely adding a different lens to how we think about community engagement. And a lot of us are thinking about how we, um, until we can get back into kind of close 
intimate conversations with community members in small groups or large group meetings? How do we engage with them through um, remote services? And there's been some great and very robust discussion amongst landscape architectures, landscape architects and planners about how we use the remote tools like apps on our cell phones, as well as Zoom and webinars like GoToMeeting to engage with people both um, asynchronously and synchronously. So allowing for people to kind of access things at their own pace, but to get out in the environment and make comments on, on spaces to provide feedback to us as, as planning team members and as members of city planning departments. I think it's, it's opening up a whole new world. And, um, and for now, I think we embrace that and we try to understand the best way to keep engaging with communities and keep celebrating the, um, the opportunity to enhance our open spaces and reconnect all of our communities with the identity of landscape and relationship to features like our waterways and our forests. We have time for probably one more question. Quick one. Okay. We have one more. All right. Let's see, let's see if uh, we can wrap this one up. Okay. So does a decentralized or distributed wastewater system contribute more or less to O&M costs? Oh, that is a great question and one I cannot necessarily answer, but I'm going to throw it to Crystal because she has had more experience with these sorts of projects. So I, I believe she could help us out yeah. with that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a tricky one because it always depends on the location. So um, in some cases, if a decentralized system is in addition to an existing system. So if water is already coming to that site because you're in an urban area, that new system where you're trying to kind of almost overlay a decentralized um, system in there, that can actually add to your cost because sometimes uh, a city may require that you still pay some baseline uh, utility connection fees, even if you're not actually using that service. Um, so, there, I would say that you know you're adding. You, in, you could potentially, in some cases, be adding um, to your O&M costs. Um, if you were just going to flat out compare a decentralized to a centralized system, um, in terms of wastewater, it's it really depends on the location and the city and how that city is managing their centralized wastewater uh, treatment. So, unfortunately, that's a huge one of those. It really depends. It's super site specific. 